I think we are good to go. Uh, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Mwanga Mastula Asha, and uh, I'll be moderating this session. We have a number of speakers who are joining us from different parts of the, of the world. And just to remind you is that this session is, we're looking at the role of education in advancing peace and security. I must also take this opportunity to thank the CODE International Institute for organizing this conference. We began on Monday and here we are into the third day of our conference. Like I've already noted that we have a number of you and uh, we shall not be wasting time because we would want to give enough time to receiving comments and all questions from those who are into the plenary or who are also joining us from different parts of the, of the, of the world. And for purposes of this um, session, I'll go right ahead and start with our first speaker, who is Ada. Um, to just give you a short bio of who Ada is, Ada is a peace and a human rights activist. She's also an educationist. She's a woman and a youth leader. She's a dedicated humanitarian, feminist, and community develop developer with a huge 12 years of experience in women and girls' leadership and community development. She's also a dynamic teacher of history and a citizen with a whooping 19 years of experience. Wow. Ada is also a recognized women human rights expert and peace leader who has been very instrumental in advocating for peace and security issues in Cameroon. She's currently leading the Women's Peace Builders, peace Builders Network in the Northwest region of Cameroon. Currently, she is the executive director and founder of Mother Hope of Cameroon, which is a non-governmental organization. She's a global change leader and, a and fellow from the CODE International Institute and the International Leaders Program from the UK. Last but not least, she is a member of the Women Mediators Across the Commonwealth, and she is a member of the Mashav Alumni of Israel. She is also an ICTAS alumni of Canada, where she has been trained as a human rights education, as a human rights educator. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Ada as she makes her remarks. Ada, please, you're welcome. Ada, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to be on the session with you all to be able to share uh, a thought about education and how education prevails in the conflict regions of Cameroon. And uh, I'm great to, to have you share with me um, your questions and um, anything which you don't understand about Cameroon, because Cameroon um, has a lot that comes in terms of education and conflict at the, at the moment. So I'll be presenting on the, the situation of education in the conflict region of the Northwest and, um, and the impact of education on, on women and children. So I'll first of all start by giving us um, a background that's a rational of, of the problem because education has not been able to be a source of prestige, a source of, of, um, of knowledge, uh, like I put it, um, as, uh, that, 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 that background which we had before has been destroyed by the socio-political conflict that exists in our region. So I'll begin by giving us a, a little background about what is prevailing in the region because I'm actually, I'm actually based in the region and I work in the region. So in early 2016, there was a call for reforms in education, the educational sector in Cameroon. And, and I want to say that Cameroon has uh, two uh, educational systems. You got the English and the French system of education. And uh, uh, the English subsystem of education had some uh, drawbacks and uh, the, the educational um, uh, board wanted to see into the place see into place that certain reforms were were 
um, made in order to um, improve on the standards of education in the in this English speaking region, which is the Northwest and Southwest regions. And this uh, actually came with the birth of the crisis in the region. So they were more specific on the English subsystem and not the French subsystem. So in a bid to provoke serious state attention, a strike action was intended by the Teachers Trade Union in 2016. Dialogue was initiated to address the situation raised. However, a power called ran out demanding for reforms on the socio-political economic aspect in the English speaking region of Cameroon, which called for advocated, advocates, they called for advocates to boycott school. For academic year down the lane, it has been a dungeon task to get school to effective resumption in the English speaking region. And so we have many young people who have not been able to go to school. They've, they've now joined the crisis and they are now, um, uh, they are now uh, um, uh, serving as the military, the, how do I put it? They are now serving as the, the boys uh, uh, in the secessionist camps. So they are being recruited and they now fight instead of going to school. A major national dialogue was converted and concluded in October 29, where we hoped that so many resolutions were going to be taken, which was going to change the situation. So we had resolutions were adopted, and the goal of bringing CCA and uh, our representatives from the respective regions uh, didn't work. Furthermore, we had a peace mission so many peace mission terms that moved into communities to interact with various stakeholders and uh, to assist in improving the socio-economical situation, especially the social climate. So in 2019-2020, the school year had recorded a significant figure of people who had uh, returned to school, though not very stable. The school milieu didn't have the security that it deserved. And so many parents kept their children at home, but the number had increased from what prevailed in 2016, 2017. And so with this, we, we, we find the this, this struggle. The struggle of getting children go back to school was prominent only in the, in the, 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 the division, not, not in, in, the, in the provinces. That is not, not in, in the specific schools in the regions. Not everywhere in the divisions could you find children going to school. So the subdivisions didn't have any school. We had just on specific schools where children could attend. And then this brought a lot of challenges for the teachers who were in, in the main schools in the cities because the number had increased and there was a lot of deviant uh, behavior. And teachers couldn't be able to carry out effective actions in regulating uh, the children and teaching them effectively as before. So with the coming of the new COVID pandemic, it became a great challenge for parents who were afraid that their children could possibly be infected. And so they kept back their children. And so after that, the government uh, actually declared that schools had to stop and children had to stay at home until they found out solutions. So we'll see that the prevailing conflict context of affairs uh, affected the students, the teachers, parents, and other educational personnel. And they have all suffered from trauma because it's, it's been a difficult situation um, out of school and thinking of coming back to school in October. So many teachers have suffered kidnapping, and, uh, uh, seizure of property, destruction of documents, Many schools have been burnt because they see that education is a source uh, of, of conflict in the crisis. That if they have to, if they, the secessionists see that if they have to hold on education, so many things are going to be able to prevail in the region in terms of the demands which they are asking the government. And so it has created a lot of fear and suspicious and uncertainty on the daily realities of the school environment that prevails in the region. Education being the bedrock of, of, of 
of acquiring a literacy and, uh, and also competence, it's at present endangered. In the basic education sector, statistics of number of people registered for the first school level examination uh, in 2016 shows a drop from 4,000 uh, 4,077 uh, 4, people to 36,207. That is in 2017. And then in 2018, we had a drop from, uh, that went down to 12,723 people. And then we also found that in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the other sub uh, subsections, like figures from the ordinary level and A levels also dropped to from 14, uh, 44,146 uh, students to 18,221 students. That's in 2016. And in 2019, we had 4,879 people to 2,229 people. So 2019 actually shows the drastic drop of pupils in the school milieu. With that, the school authorities have not been able to drop down efforts. We had civil society and also administrators who came out uh, with the teacher trade union to be able to, to, to talk to, on the stakeholders, to talk also on uh, uh, civil societies who are engaging in the, in the domain of education, that they, they will continue to be able to raise their voices loud so that children can resume education in the English subsystem. Uh, sub so with that, you will find that there, there has been um, a lot of inconsistency in the educational setup in the region as a result of the crisis. But with that, we, we as uh, civil society, we as uh, educationists have not been able to stop, to be able to say education cannot wait Education must continue because it's important for us to send our kids to school. As women on the ground, we see the need for our children to go to school, which is very important because most of them have are grown and they are in the houses and they are facing lots of violence. We've got children who are now um, frustrated and they're out of the school milieu and they are forced to be able to join those in the crisis to, to, to fight back. Um, this has also brought us to, to find actions which can be able to motivate uh, parents and motivate uh, those in the, in, the, in, the, in the fighting camps to, to let the children go to school by preaching um, the issues on peace and trying to negotiate with them that education is important. We can't keep our children out of school because we think that we're fighting for a cause that is the just cost. And I think that we, we are hoping that um, in October this year, lots of children are going to resume school. But again, in the, in the, um, in the divisions where schools cannot prevail, there have been community schools that have been created. And so we have lots of community schools, but it's difficult for the children to be able to integrate themselves into the teaching of these community schools because we have teachers who are not experts, teachers who have not been trained, and who go about teaching the children from all the levels and which makes it not effective. And so we are calling that our school milieus should be open for the children to go back to school and that parents should also have to join their hands to bring the children back to the school milieu and kill the fear of their children not coming back to school. So I would also want to uh, maybe thank all parents who have been able to um, keep the students, uh, the children at home all this while because it's not been an easy thing. We have the rate of teenage pregnancies which have increased. We have the rate of rape which has increased. We have the rate of, of, um, of child trafficking which has increased. And we also have the rate of uh, deviant behavior which has increased. Lots of children now take a lot of drugs and it's pretty very difficult for the parents and the uh, teachers to control the students. In some schools, we do not have, uh, the, the school authorities cannot be able to control the children because they are afraid. If you have to be able to discipline a child, the child is going to be able to report to the secessionist group and you as a teacher, your life is at risk because you are going to be caught and you are going to be killed. And so you find 
the teachers living in fear, the schools that operate live in fear, and it is, it is, it is something that we're calling on the international community to be able to, to see into this problem so that lots of solutions are, can, uh, can be, be reached at with the government and so that children can go back to school. In a nutshell, that is the situation that prevails in the Northwest region. I, I am ready for any question and any clarification. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ada. Thank you so much for that very informative uh, discussion. Uh, to just highlight what has been said in Ada's presentation is uh, the impact that the conflict or the political conflict has created within the with the region and or the impact that it has had on uh, on education. He also highlights that very many children have opted to joining fighting rather than going to to school. And in the in this due course. We've seen also so many teachers who have been kidnapped, who have been killed. killed. Uh, Ada also highlights uh, the impact of COVID, to which we've seen that uh, very many parents have resorted to not taking their kids to school because they thought that their children would get infected in the, in the, due, in the due, due course. At that point, I'll bring in our next speaker, Miss Dina. Ms. Dina, you're most welcome. Uh, to just give you a short bio of who Ms. Dina is, Dina Hussein is the Counterterrorism and Dangerous Organizations Policy Manager for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Ms. Hussein's research background is centered around the themes of securization of civilian space, mass radicalization, counterterrorism, operations in the Middle East and the intersection of counter-terrorism and the protection of fundamental freedoms. Previously, she has worked with the UK's Foreign Commonwealth Office, the United Nations and Amnesty International. Ms. Dina, please welcome to give your remarks on the role of education in advancing education, security and peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masula. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all. Um, and I am absolutely honored to be on a panel with so many outstanding women that are working in the women, peace and security field. Um, from my side, I just want to highlight some overarching trends that I see working within the environment of the counterterrorism field. As you know, most likely are most of you are working on the upstream portion of the work that I end up dealing with on the downstream side. Um, a lot of the work that I do really centers around building work streams that build up resiliency when it comes to online resiliency and understanding of um, the utilization of the internet and how it can be used to, to radicalize and to move people around down that spectrum of radicalization. A big part of my job really leans into educating and educating women specifically uh, to find opportunities both online and offline. One of the big work streams that I concentrate on really looks at equalizing the playing field for women when it comes to utilizing online tools to participate and to upskill and upscale their voices when it comes to advocating around peace building missions and peace building work streams. The three things I really wanted to highlight in this conversation is that education is an introductory means by which women can really vocalize and heighten their ability to, to have these discussions with their community, their community. One of the biggest indicators of a woman's success is both her education and her economic network but also all of the, all of the um, different opportunities that are given to her. As mentioned in the panel earlier on, one of the biggest flags, that biggest red flags that we see when we work with counterterrorism is that women's education and the weaponization of women's education has become a really disturbing trend when it comes to dangerous actors. Education is really spoken about as a uh, right in many places, but one of the things that is really concerning that over the last five to 10 years, we've noticed the trend of terrorist actors, hateful actors, looking at women's education and aiming to weaponize that against their cultures and their societies. 
So when distilling that and when looking at that from a wider perspective, you'll notice that it's seen also on the opposite side as an, as an opportunity to empower women and elevate their voices and elevate their stature within their communities. So that's one of the really concerning trends, this idea that the weaponization of women's education has become really prolific um, in a negative way sometimes. On the other hand, I think one of the things that we're noticing now is with the move towards more, um, more young people and women in particular uh, being impacted immensely by this virus, one of the very concerning trends that we notice is that women are the first to be put up to take care of their homes and to take care of their families. And so one of the biggest impacts that we see is even at a larger scale. So beyond just the primary education, which we all, I'm sure many of my fellow panelists will touch on, women's education when it comes to higher ranking at, um, at high school education, college education, they are the first ones to be asked to sacrifice their access to education during this crisis. They are the first ones to be asked to sacrifice their access to, to their colleges and their access to all of these different opportunities because they are perceived as being the first ones to have to take care of their families. That becomes an adversely, uh, an immensely uh, problematic aspect because we know that the generation of women that are currently being educated are going to be the generations that will be negotiating peace. And any of the obstacles that they face at this portion in time will have a much larger and more adverse effect as we move forward. So we are losing day by day the peace builders and the peace negotiations that we see. We know that when women are at the table for negotiations around peace, they are 30% more likely to come to a conclusion with the other side. Women not to, not to make this a very uh, basic discussion about gendered natures, but women are statistically going to be more likely to come to a conclusion around negotiations if they are at the table. So if we are losing women's access to, the, to these spaces, then what does that say about our ability to, to access these discussions around peace building and around ne negotiations? So that's another big concern. And then finally, one of the things that I really wanted to flag is when we talk about education, we are really talking about the point that I made earlier um, around education for online resiliency and education about utilizing online tools. And that's a really important portion of the discussion that I think historically we haven't really, we haven't really been highlighting. In order for women in the majority of the world to get access to a computer, they need to go to a school, they need to go to a, a, an NGO's organization or building. And so with the coronavirus, but also with the lack of access recently, we see that not only are we losing education from a more, more basic, a, a more basic skill set, but you're losing the ability for women to, to really become uh, natives in the internet age and their ability to access these tools that the UN has now stated are fundamental rights. So that's another really concerning portion of the discussion. If women are not able to now maneuver equally to their male uh, equivalents on the online scale, then that gives them less access to economic growth, less access to opportunities of open source education. It gives them less access to an ability to connect across cultures. And we've seen historically that one of the biggest, ed ed one of the biggest indicators of why somebody I come from a from a radicalization and extremism field, so excuse me if I lean heavily towards that side, but one of the biggest end indicators of why somebody who is radicalized and somebody who is taking part in hateful um, actions can then be pulled back from that world is if they know and if they are in touch and in communication with somebody from the opposite side. Because we know that it humanizes the other and it humanizes um, the, the different factions to one another. And more and more, we're seeing that while offline people less and less have access to each other in order to have these discussions in person, the access to the online sphere really does allow for that more than ever. So once again, if women are now not being given access to that sphere, they're less likely to be having these discussions, less likely to be humanizing the other and meeting and having these discussions. And before I hand over, I really just want to wrap it up with a quote. Um, just looking at the numerics, and I'm Egyptian, so I'm going to use the Egyptian example. I grew up in Cairo. I was educated in, in Egypt up until the age of 21. Um, but looking back at the latest rankings for Egypt, out of 
in 2015, the Global Gender Gap Index, which measured this, the disparity between men and women across countries, ranks Egypt at 136 out of, 40, out of 145 countries worldwide. Women have significantly lower participation in the workforce than men. Um, 26 versus 79. So 26 women are out in the workforce versus 79% of men and much lower literacy rate. Women have a 65% literacy rate versus 82% of males. So when we look at that, we're seeing that the disparity at, even at 2015 and 2016 is huge. Um, it means that if you are not getting the education, you are not going to be one, the one that is in the room when we are discussing resources to gender equity. You're not going to be the one in the room when, when the education minister or the security minister is having talks about what are our demands and what are our budgetary requirements. So when you look at this holistic picture, it's really very concerning. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of different questions that come up, but one, one quote as promised from Queen Rania, who I hope you all know of Jordan, is that if you educate a woman, you educate her family. And if you educate a girl, you educate the future. I think probably most of you have heard this, but I think it's a beautiful quote and I, I think it's very apt here. Thanks so much, Matsala. Thank you so much, Dina. Uh, it's, it's, it's really an informative uh, dis discussion that you, you bring on board. Uh, just a, a quick recap from your presentation. You highlighted the fact that uh, women participate uh, in very many issues, uh, right from informal education, informal education, but at the end of the day, they're not given, uh, do not benefit like their male counterparts. I like the fact that you raised uh, the figures um, that emanate from the global gender gap Egypt at uh, 136 out of the 145. I think that happens for most of uh, the developing countries where we are seeing women not participating so much. So at the end of the day, if women are not educated, absolutely they're not going to participate in any key decision-making programs, as you highlight. They will not be put at the table. Uh, at that point, let me, let me bring in our next speaker. Thank you so much, Dina. And just remind our participants in the event that you have any questions, please post them in the chat box. We may, in the event that we run out of time, we can always just read them. Um, at this point, let me bring in our next speaker with Samantha. Samantha is um, a Ugandan lawyer. She is also a feminist and a human rights activist. She is the country representative of SIDO Institute Uganda. She is also the vice president of the East African Justice and Gender Foundation Coalition. And at the same time, she's the chairperson of the Uganda Women Coalition Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Samantha has spearheaded and participated in the drafting of the Domestic Violence Bill, which was later passed into law uh, as the Domestic Violence Act of 2010. She, academically, she holds a Bachelor's of Laws and a Master's of Laws all from Makere University and a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the Law Development Center here in Uganda. Please join me in welcoming Samantha to make her remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masutola. Uh, once again, my name is Samantha Sayun Simeta and I am the country representative of SEDO Institute Uganda, SEDO being the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Now, I'll take you direct into straight away into what's happening in our country. And we see that girls with little or no education are far more likely to be married and, and they suffer domestic violence, they live in poverty, and also in most cases, they actually lack a say over household spending or even their own health care. They don't really have a say compared to the better educated peers. And this harms them. It also harms their children and also the communities. And then uh, also to note, uh, particularly Uganda as a country, women with primary education or even less globally are married as children. They lack control over household resources and condone wife beating compared to women who finish high school. 
because when you look at uh, most of or most of the women that are actually battered, uh, you'll notice that these are children, these are women without without any kind of education, especially for more education. And then also it brings me to the issue of teenage pregnancies, which is very rampant in our country. Nearly one in five girls in Uganda becomes pregnant before 18. While pregnancy related causes, we know that this accounts for most deaths among young girls. Now these same girls, what is very sad, because they want to continue with school and out of fear from their parents, they end up terminating the pregnancy and thus suffering abortion related complications which result into death. And all this can be measured in terms of uh, lost income. And uh, we also know that Uganda has a Kai clause, for example, an abortion and only provides for it under a very narrow scope. So most of these teenagers, they get pregnant and because of the restrictive legal and policy environment that we're in as a country, we have an abortion, we have a very restrictive legal environment. And so they are forced to resort to crude methods like taking jig or soap, using hangers and so forth to remove the pregnancy. It is very evident in most regions that better educated women tend to marry later and have fewer children. And also, of course, most women that are highly educated are able to make their own decisions regarding their bodies. They have bodily autonomy and say how many children, they always have a right and, and they can always say how many children they want to have and maybe how often they want to have the children. Thus, they have greater autonomy in making decisions and more power to act for their children's uh, uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. And also, when you educate a woman or a girl, she has better control over sexual and reproductive health and rights and ownership and control of land and housing and so forth. So basically women and girls are increasingly completing school and university, but their work choices remains restricted. And this is a very big challenge even here in Uganda, that even after school, you've had your degree, you've had your diploma, you've gone through high school, whatever it is, but the work choices are very restricted by laws and even the social norms that dictate whether and what work is appropriate. This is a very big challenge. So as I wrap up basically on this is that uh, this is like a cycle. You don't have education, then teenage pregnancy, pregnancy or child marriage, then no employment, then you look at poverty, and all this increases uh, uh, gender gaps. Uh, but uh, regardless, as Sedo Institute Uganda, we have come up with strategies, okay? We have come up with strategies, and uh, one of the things that we do is that uh, we hold primary, we, ho we, we encourage the fact that states or Uganda as a country should hold primary responsibility for advancement of the women, peace and security agenda. And in achieving this, we actually came up with a forum to strengthen approaches and strategies for implementation. Uh, we did not only do that, but we have also adopted plans on women, peace and security, where we have integrated the women, peace and security agenda in local and community development plans and policies. And at the same time, we also ensure that women's international human rights are embedded and respected at the national level. So um, it is still work in progress, I must say. And then of course, we have also introduced technical and vocational education and training because we do not only focus on formal education. There is a lot that you can do to help the girl child. And this has left a tremendous positive impact impact. The training that I'm talking about normally includes non-formal training and skills development, along with the necessary elements of life skills and, and literacy. So basically, these strategies have brought about empowerment of women, as well as equipping them with new vocational skills, which bring in both intrinsic and extrinsic values, increased capacity and self-worth. And in the end, uh, you find that once disadvantaged and despondent girls and women are able to feel capable of serving society and contributing to their social economic emancipation, as well as participating effectively in the country's development. And finally, we do have some recommendations. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, this is a very interesting topic for me as a person, 
but I'm, I'm trying to wrap up so I don't take a lot of time. Now, one of the recommendations that we strongly uphold is uh, going out to, to the policymakers. Now, policymakers and stakeholders need to address some of these challenges. For example, Uganda, we know that abortion is heavily restrictive and illegal, but regardless of it being illegal, it doesn't stop the girls from actually getting pregnant and terminating these pregnancies in unsafe ways, which leads to death as a result of abortion-related complications. So we have moved, I must say, I'm proud of SEDO Institute Uganda. We have moved the Uganda Law Reform Commission to have some of the laws amended and actually make abortion very safe. And like I said, it's still work in progress. And then the other thing that I would recommend is uh, expanding opportunities and amplifying the voices of women and girls because gender equality conveys broad development dividends for men and boys, families and communities. Because constraining women's agency uh, by limiting what jobs they can do or condone, condone, condoning gender-based violence can cause huge economic losses and also hinder development efforts. And then there is also a need to enhance women's land rights because these can be strengthened by progressive legal reforms and improved governance. And then last but not least, the other recommendation, um, there is need for women's groups to step up their game. And now I'm talking about us, you and I. Women's groups and collective action play a very important role in building momentum for progressive form. Such women's movements are associated with more comprehensive policies on violence against women and actually you notice that when more women are elected into office, now policy making increasingly reflects the priorities of families and women, and in the end results into greater responsiveness to citizen needs. And then finally, a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on investing in programs that uplift the lives of the victims of conflicts and violence, these being women. Samantha, are you there? That are mostly affected. And with that, everyone and uh, Mastula, I thank you. Oh, yes, okay. I'm here. I'm here, Mastula. Okay, thank you so much, Samantha. Uh, I realize that uh, you, you, you highlight a, a, a point that was also earlier on noted by Dina in regard to, to the levels of women and girls acquiring education, which at the end of the day, uh, becomes a hindrance to their appearance in places like in the board in the boardroom and I myself being from uh, Uganda what Samantha alludes to is very evident in the levels of children and all women who are acquiring ed education she notes that we have high rates of uh, early pregnancies and early marriages it comes back to the issue of patriarchy this morning we had a session uh, just within the East African region and the issue of patriarchy kept coming up. It kept, it kept coming up. Here in Uganda, just like many patriarchal societies, you will realize that a girl will not be taken to school uh, simply because a parent believes that if a girl goes to school in one way or the other, it violates the cultural norms and all values of a, particular, of a certain a certain culture. But again, Samantha highlights something that is very pertinent when she says that again, there is a gender gap when it comes to the, to the women who have already acquired education, but at the end of the day, cannot acquire or cannot get certain employment simply because there is a cultural belief of thinking that, you know, women are supposed to be entitled to a certain type of jobs compared to their, to their male counterparts. Uh, at this point, thank you, Samantha, so much. Uh, we don't have so much time to, I will not go too much into summarizing what you've already said. Allow me welcome our new next speaker, rather, Oksana Potapova. I hope I pronounced this well. Oksana Potapova from Ukraine. She's a, a trainer and a practitioner of critical pedagogy. She's a gender specialist and feminist researcher. 
She also works with groups and communities on issues of human rights, dialogue, gender, and women's rights. Oksana has also experienced working in international development organizations, specifically the British Council, Canadian Development Cooperation Program, as a project coordinator and a gender folk point. In 2014, Oksana co-founded the Theatre for Dialogue, which is an NGO where she has been working with communities affected by conflict, internally displaced people, and other marginalized groups of women to build dialogue and cohesion with communities and to also advocate for the right of vulnerable groups of women at the national and international level. Oksana, you're welcome to give your remarks, please. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure and honor for me to be uh, contributing to this um, panel and to uh, hopefully complementing uh, the words of uh, and the experience uh, of my colleagues um, from all across the world. Uh, I want to say that uh, the issues that have been raised by uh, all the previous speakers are of uh, extreme importance. Um, and uh, I don't want to uh, repeat myself uh, in, in stressing uh, the um, foundational and uh, importance of access to education for everyone, uh, for boys and girls, for women and uh, men. Uh, what I would like to focus uh, my uh, contribution uh, on is uh, the how and the why of, uh, of education, speaking more specifically to um, my experience with uh, critical and feminist pedagogy and uh, theater of the oppressed as uh, methodologies of um, working with uh, communities affected by conflict, uh, but also working with uh, legislators and uh, decision makers and share some of the key principles that I, uh, I hope can be applicable to many different realms and spheres, not only to this uh, specific type of work that, that we have been doing. So I want to start with, uh, with asking uh, the question why, uh, why it is important uh, in my opinion to talk about education as a, as a key tool for uh, peace building, conflict prevention and uh, conflict transformation. Um, we all probably agree that conflict is rooted in, uh, in violence and hierarchies and in, in power imbalances that are at the core of patriarchal structures of society that we live in and that are perpetuated uh, by conflicts. Um, education, uh, formal and non-formal education, uh, but mostly formal, is one of the key uh, channels uh, to pass down uh, these structures and to instill in uh, kind of new generations the, the ways uh, that we, uh, the society is run. So uh, I, I believe, while I believe access to education is important, the way we do education and what we teach and how we teach is equally important because we can either uh, recreate the structures of power and uh, hierarchies or we can transform them. And this is where critical pedagogy approaches come to uh, place where we, uh, through revisiting the role of the teacher, through um, revisiting uh, the approaches to learning that uh, we use both with children and with adults, um, we can uh, decenter the role of the expert, of uh, somebody who knows best and who's there to teach, um, uh, speaking of the role of the teacher. And uh, we learn to put at the center uh, the question or the problem or the topic we are trying to analyze um, and as a group uh, search for answers together. Um, we have done this specifically with uh, women who have been uh, displaced uh, by the conflict in, in Eastern Ukraine and uh, found their homes in new regions uh, inside our country. And by uh, looking at issues of security and peace and reintegration together with them, we have been able to widen uh, our definition of security coming from militarized security to uh, human security and um, broadening our understanding of how we are mutually affected uh, by the conflict. Uh, so I've already started to, talk, to answer my second question of not only why, but how. Um, critical pedagogy and uh, feminist pedagogy specifically uh, is uh, putting at its core the idea of 
uh, reshaping and transforming uh, power structures. And I would like to just uh, quote uh, one of the uh, prominent um, writers, uh, historians, and artists, uh, Gerda Lerner, who said, um, uh, to step outside of patriarchal thought means overcoming the deep-seated resistance within ourselves towards accepting ourselves and our knowledge as valid. It means getting rid of the great men in our heads and substituting them for ourselves, our sisters, our anonymous foremothers. So the how, the critical pedagogy, asks the question of who knows and who is the expert and how do we know and teaches us to learn from those who we don't see as experts um, and also to put ourselves as a source of knowledge. This is uh, leading me to this third uh, question for whom um, education for peace is important. Often we see um, that communities affected by conflict uh, are uh, given access to education, to formal and non-formal training, which again, I repeat, is key. But often, uh, unfortunately, in my experience, uh, the efforts of uh, promoting access to education, knowledge and learning stop there. As if uh, this is something that only the oppressed and the underprivileged need, uh, and those who are in power and those who manage resources and um, design programs are not in need of uh, educating themselves in a critical way. So uh, my point and my, uh, I guess, learning from, from our experience is that, um, yes, coming together as uh, groups of uh, people op or oppressed or affected by conflict is important in order to create our own reality and to create our own knowledge and advocacy. But at the same time, um, learning together with people that make decisions, uh, creating training spaces where uh, community members and civil society and um, government officials and police can work together and work from, uh, learn from each other is critically important. Because then uh, not only by learning the educational material, but being in the same spaces together, uh, these power structures and this separation that uh, puts people in different uh, positions. You know, I am the police officer and I am the government official and you are the woman in the community um, are, are deconstructed. Um, and uh, the last question I want to ask is uh, when? And uh, some of my colleagues have spoken uh, about the importance of uh, access to education to children and uh, adults. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, maybe I'm, I won't be innovative, but I would say uh, that I'm a big advocate of, of lifelong uh, learning and education as um, critical education as a tool for constant thinking and revisiting our realities. I myself being the benefit of the, ben the beneficiary of uh, the Cody Women Leadership Program uh, at the age of 30, uh, I can say without any exaggeration that uh, the learning that I have received, the embodied and practical learning that I have received around a feminist leadership, um, feminist pedagogy, um, power and conflict transformation has uh, uh, changed my life around and has made me the feminist activist that I am. So uh, leadership programs for women and men in uh, peace and conflict context are extremely important. But again, uh, I think how they are done and what is uh, at the core of the pedagogical approach uh, is uh, equally important. And finally, I would say that uh, in spirit of uh, decolonizing knowledge and knowledge approaches, that uh, we keep seeing, unfortunately, in uh, many of the conflict-affected contexts. Uh, it is vitally important that more and more locally uh, driven uh, activists and leaders become the educators themselves, that we uh, do away with the approach where we always need um, an, a foreign expert with an international degree um, coming to teach us about what peace and, and gender equality mean to us. Uh, because the more I work in this sector, the more I interact with people coming, they say, we have so much to learn from you and we, you could be our teachers. And, and I think they are right. So what I, I, I leave us all with the question of what does it take for us to flip uh, the power at, at the largest level, at the level where global programs of education are designed, are uh, funded, 
and are implemented in order to put at the center the local knowledge, the indigenous knowledge and the leadership of, uh, of local educators for both children and adults. Thank you. Okay, yeah, well, thank you, Oksana. Thank you so much. The, the one thing that kept running in my mind is the power imbalance that exists between women and, uh, and men, which obviously brings in the issue of uh, critical and feminist pedagogy that uh, Oksana tries to, to highlight, where, which highlights the man or the men being advantageous vis-a-vis -vis the the, the, the woman. But again, in your recommendations, uh, you make a very uh, important recommendation, which to me, for the case of Uganda, is very ironical when you state that uh, we need to work together and at the same time you, you state that uh, as victims, uh, as in this case, as the women, we need to come out and, you know, make our own narrative, uh, work with government. But again, when you stated this, this is a very good recommendation. But I was like, can this work in some of these countries? Countries where government is actually fighting those who are trying to bring women and put them on the, on the table. Countries like Uganda, for example, they come up with laws which are against which are against people, in this case, which are against women. We have a very perturbing law, for example, here in Uganda. It's called the Public Order Management Act, which does not allow anybody to come together and you know, talk about what affects, affects them. Otherwise, it's a very good recommendation. How I wish it, um, uh, it is taken up by those who are in, in power for the good of, uh, of, of, of women. Otherwise, thank you so much, Oksana. And uh, to remind ourselves, just in case you have any comment or any question, please just put it in the post it in the chat chat box. At this point, let me bring in our um, uh, our keynote speaker. Asha, Asha, we have one more speaker. Um, Musomi is here from Bangladesh. Yes, yes. So me, can you please uh, go ahead with your, your, your presentation? You are most welcome. Thank you, Asha. And it's my great pleasure to meet you all the outstanding women leaders around the world here. Thank you very much. This is Mushumi Haldar. I am working from uh, Bangladesh and I am working with Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh. In short, it's called CCDB. So today I would like to focus on my presentation on how uh, education plays great role, great uh, plays great role to change positive changes in women's life. As as I said, I'm a practitioner, a trainer, um, a gender specialist, and of course, a feminist. So my presentation is mostly focuses on uh, the field level experiences and some success stories we have, uh, we have regarding the role of education in women's life. So um, here in Bangladesh, our constitution gives equal rights to men and women, and uh, our government has two too much affirmative actions for girls' education in recent times. Then that's why the enrollment of girls in schools has been increased drastically in recent years. And uh, however, attending uh, formal education for all people in Bangladesh is a big challenge some couple of years ago. And uh, basically, I'm talking about the people who are in their middle age right now. So when, um, when CCTV starts working with people, they keep focused on non-formal education for the adults. So what does CCTV do? And CCTV working, actually working with the poor, marginalized and climate vulnerable people in, in basically uh, disaster prone areas of Bangladesh. And CCTV keep focusing on uh, on just to create just and caring society and it values women empowerment the most. So uh, in a series of individual trainings, CCTV has uh, formed more than 800 people's organization at the community level where 90% of them are women-led and the 
approximate membership, 80% is women. To make this happen, CCDB has provided a lot of educational support to community women. And uh, our result shows that when we, when uh, when women receivers, uh, when the receivers of our training is women, they are the better better implementers than men. And initially, it wasn't easy at all to make women attend those skill development training. But however, they make it, and uh, the result is amazing. And uh, here I'm just focusing on some of our good results. That uh, by receiving some trainings like uh, women leadership in human rights, uh, peace building, and uh, uh, in different income generating activities, women are local women are now playing active contribution in the society. Now they are actually they are involving with different income generating activities, and you know it gives them the financial security, which is the most urgent issue for women security in the society and uh, it has at the same time it has also been reported that women are uh, valued uh, as a valued as an asset in the society and their family and the so-called decision making power they have now and uh, it has been also reported that household violence has been decreased remarkably in those areas where we are now uh, giving women the educational input the learning inputs and apart from that, CCTV we also promote women leadership. And now women take part, actively take part in advocacy lobbying with the government. And it is our great pleasure to share with you that many of our women are now the elected members of local government institutions and other different uh, standing committees. And they keep their voice raises. So what they want, they can be, they can be pronounced by their own right now. So um, here are some uh, short stories that how education and non-formal education keeps changes, keep changes, uh, keep positive changes to our community women. And uh, as already all of our speakers says about the importance of education, I'm here just uh, giving some stories, lab stories from our part. And uh, when we see that Bangladesh is develop Bangladesh is a really developing country and it needs far more way to go regarding education and literacy as our literacy rate is not uh, at all remarkable at all now. So we are here, we can see how education plays a critical role in changing women's life. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much, Usubi. I hope I pronounced that right. And I thank you so, 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 so much. I think my take home is uh, the level of uh, at which domestic violence has reduced in, in areas where you've uh, offered informal education to, to, to women. Uh, Robin, I think I'll at this point invite our keynote listener. That's great. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, um, just a second. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a short bio of uh, our keynote speaker, so, sorry, keynote listener. She's uh, Muzin Dured and she's a Syrian refugee who arrived in Montreal in November, 2016. She is deeply involved in human rights issues and has the first hand experience in dealing with refugees and women's crisis. She's working as a liaison officer with the White Helmet. She's also a co founder and a youth general secretary member of Syrian Women's Political Movement, the first political movement to engage Syrian women on politics and peace talks. Duraid is also the founder of the Indigenous Refugees Movement, which is a safe space for women and series workshop for youth on lessons learned between both groups, which aim to build strong bonds in Canada by learning the truth and resilience. She is also the recipient of Can Canadian Excellence in Global Women and Children's Health Award for the Young Category of 2019. 
She's the recipient of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers Annual Award for Outstanding Advocacy on behalf of the human rights of refugees. Last but not least, Jureid has experience from her work with the White Helmets and Folksen DCA on supporting various projects with a focus on protection programs, which included minds, risk education, and sexual and gender-based violence. She's a master student of public policy and public administration at school, public administration school at Concordia University. Please join me in welcoming Muzin Dured as she marks, makes her remarks, having listened in from all the speakers. Welcome Dured. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me today. It's such an honor to be with uh, all uh, those uh, women, uh, women uh, peace builders. And uh, thanks for sharing your insight uh, today. Uh, from my conclusion that uh, what I heard from all of you, um, that the 1395 uh, resolution, uh, Women, Peace and Security, it should like uh, play the role of preventing war and not like uh, make war more like not to make like a genderizing the war which is like to make it more safer for for women um our ultimate goal it's to uh, to stop the war and uh, because like women not only like a general for for all countries but also because women who who, who pay the most um during the war so this is like a a, a good like a uh, highlight I, I took to from um, all the presentations uh, that we received and uh, it's to remember that the, the ultimate goal it's to prevent the war and um, and also to to be flexible uh, with our programming and uh, re uh, response for for the situation because like a, a woman uh, usually and often uh, have like a limit uh, uh, um, as like a limit options uh, in in terms of when it comes to mobility so uh, uh we need to 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 find like a solution in the creating um more flexible programs to give uh women and girls access to education uh and especially now uh, after covid area uh when we we um we like COVID nineteen uh, has proven that that it's 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 so important to be like a, to have like a school uh, homeschooling and also online learning for um, for for children. But also, it's so important to give it to give that for women because like women are the most who uh, put out of the school when it comes to uh, uh, um, uh, like crisis. Uh, so this is also uh, important to remember. And uh, and also uh, from the experience of our speakers today, uh, uh, there is like a, a recommendation uh, to uh, uh, to enable the voices of uh, uh, activists and uh, women uh, peace builders, which is like also to have like a, a equal participation and meaningful participation of uh, uh, those activists who working on the ground and was like. A, relevant with the with the with the context of local uh, uh, communities and uh, this is not all not only by like inviting them for the um, for like a webinar like meetings but also to have an equal participation in equal uh, uh, um, a chance to uh, uh, designing the policy and like designing the program and also to engage them uh, in in, in uh, at the table of of, um, of decision making. Uh, it's so important to remember here like uh, this is uh, as like um, uh, we have like a pain and we go to to doctor and we ask the doctor to uh, give us like a medicine so no one could describe uh, describe the, the the situation as the the patients so this is the same things with the women peace builders they need to speak about the pain and the problem from their perspective and to be a, a, a present at the table of all sorts of, of like uh, meetings, uh, uh, webinars, and uh, and designing the policy and response. Um, 
the also the situation um, now it's 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 uh, it's getting worse than be but before after the pandemic and after all those um, uh, situation and increasing the poverty uh, across the the world and uh, also that it's like a call from our speakers to um, like to 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 uh, 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 enlarging our our uh, uh, capacity and uh, efforts to finding a solution for this situation because like also women who uh, pay like the the the, the highest um, uh, 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 price of uh, this situation which is like a, a combined like war and uh, uh, and uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, um, also like a, um, uh, creating like a new uh, 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 a new uh, 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 chance or like options for women peace builders because uh, often they, they 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 are under risk because they playing like multiple role uh, not only to uh, uh, to uh, like a, against like war but also to to find a solution for the, for for women and girls and uh, the the space for women now um, getting smaller and smaller uh, than before so uh, this is why we need to protect activists like as what we have today uh, this is so important to finding a way uh, to protect the uh, activists when they are under risk or like when they are um, under like any kind of threat or and and here like I would also uh, uh, to highlight that uh, that include cyber violence cyber crimes because often it's now um, uh, we we saw like a multiple and many cases of uh, 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 virtual uh, uh, crimes. So this is also so important to to recognize as a as a like a real threat against uh, women's uh, women peace builders, um, and also like also to give them like a, a, a um, an option to uh, uh, as a capacity building to to strengthen their capacity building like by like like I provide them uh, trainings uh, education uh, because also education it's a luxury in 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 the context of of war and conflicts so um in and also uh here like um uh, as a as a action we 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 could like say uh, uh, um, uh like a that women also need like a stipends and support, uh, finan uh, finance support for um, uh, for providing like internet, technology, uh, devices, and all those uh, stuffs to uh, following to to be engaged and also to uh, strengthen their capacity building, which is so important because like during their their work, um, it's it's so hard to. To take like time for their uh, for themselves uh, and to uh, in terms of like uh, uh, to uh, develop them themselves and improve uh, their education. So here we we talking about two levels, which is like the women and girls in general, like as as a target group, and also uh, women uh, women peace builders and activists in 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 those uh, contexts, uh, which is so important to keep it in mind that. Um, all the time we need to be uh, flexible uh, creative and finding ways to protect women because in in some contexts it's it's um uh, it's not allowed for women to to go to school not allowed for women, for women to get out of their uh, uh homes so this is why we need to benefit from the virtual uh, and e-learning now that we have and to provide it for them uh, in in a in a in, in a privacy and, and keep them like a, a, a safe also uh, and uh, yeah finally uh, uh, like thanks for sharing all your insights it's really um, uh, useful for us to understand the different aspects in this different situation. Uh, uh, especially like uh, uh, um, uh, what Dina said that um, uh, education it's that the first element and the, f the first uh, 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 like a, a element to uh, prevent uh, extreme extremists uh, especially in a case of war where it's like an active war 
uh, like uh, Middle East and uh, and other contexts, uh, in, uh, like in Africa. So it's it's so important to prevent uh, extremism by uh, education, by giving the the generation who been like witnessed the war uh, a, a chance to to learn and to open their minds and to uh, build the future because all what we have it's the next generation and uh, and youth and young people so this is so important to give them this a chance uh, to um the, to have like a transform transformative transformative uh, solution for them and also for us and for uh, uh, um, the countries uh, uh, in work. So um, thank you so much for what you uh, sharing with us and for your time today. And um, I think now it's the time for uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mozina. Thanks for, for, for your, your, your remarks. Uh, we have uh, some questions within the chat box, and I think the first question is goes to Samantha. Samantha, are you there? Yes, yes, Mastula, I'm right here. Okay, so the the question is, says: Now we know that the enrollment of girls almost all over the world have increased and girls' performance in primary level is almost equal to that of boys in primary. Um, just a second. Now, why does the number of girls' retention and complete completion reduce Why does the number of girls' retention and completion reduce as they move from one stage to the other? Okay, thank you very much, Mastula. I think I do understand the question coming in from Juliet. Is it Juliet Brown? Thank you for the question. Now, we need to first of all understand the constraints faced by adults and girls. Even when thinking about what can be done, say, to improve education opportunities for girls. We have issues of early marriages, teenage pregnancies. Then look at the school health policies that we have, for where, for example, when pregnant students, where pregnant students are suspended from school. You know, we know that in our schools, even here in Uganda, once a girl gets pregnant, she's suspended or expelled. And this definitely creates a big gap. And of course, also a lack of interest in remaining in school often comes up by the time you go through the process of delivery, the nine months, and, and maybe you've had some challenges. This is your first baby. It's only natural that you would lose some bit of interest in actually remaining in school. And then also, this is not mainly for Uganda only, but uh, we know that in most countries, social norms and gender roles also affect the ability of girls to remain in school. Because even when this girl gets married, even when she's still in school and is expelled from school, we know that most husbands show little interest in supporting the adolescent wife's education. And sometimes, probably even when they would want to support this girl child, it is an expense they cannot, they cannot afford. And I believe that at the end of the day, parents have a very, very big role to play in as far as uh, the girl child is concerned in uh, retaining her education, because most parents shy away from talking to their girls about their reproductive system. They do not want to give them this information. And, and, then, and then they end up getting information from the wrong sources, and there you do not know what they're going to be told. And then the other challenge is uh, domestic labor. We know that millions of girls, especially in Africa, they spend every day working to help feed themselves and their families. Girls often stay home to even take care of younger siblings and, and bear the main burden of housework. And, and, and while educating a boy is considered a sound investment, so it's sometimes considered to be a waste of time for the girls. And then in the end, they end up dropping school. Yes, thank you, Mastola. Thank you so much, Samantha. I will also ask the other participants to make their comment on this. I may repeat the question for you. Feel free to, to make your, 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 your comment 
including Muzina Durate. You can also make your comment on this. Dina, if you're still with us. The question is, um, says that, uh, Now we know that the number of uh, girls has uh, has is has increased and is almost equal to that of boys in primary. Why does the number of girls retention and completion reduce as they move from one stage to the other? Um, I can't jump for this question. Uh... I think the, the main problem here is uh, that we have like a, a child marriage, um, like um, in, in, in Syria, in, in, in camps in, uh, of IDPs or, or refugees, and also sometimes in urban settings, there is like a high number of uh, 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 child marriage. So, and this is why the chance for, for girls to get in, in school or like to continue their education, it's so low. So uh, this is why um, we need to support um, girls to, uh, 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 to continue their education. And also sometimes to provide like a, a safe schools because like um, uh, sometimes like it's, it's, uh, it's, so um, it's not like a, a close to their homes or like to their camps. So there's like a danger for them to uh, um, to go out and uh, uh, sometimes is this, there's like a rape and harassment uh, in their uh, way to, to, to school. So this is why uh, usually parents prefer to keep uh, their girls inside the home than that, that outside. Uh, so this is also one of the reasons. So there's like many, but like uh, from Syria, this is the problem as we have like the the, the highest number of, uh, of refugees and IDPs uh, in the world. So, yeah, um, there's like a lack of, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, afford affordable numbers of school uh, for, uh, for girls and like in general, like not only for girls, but like uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, what should, should continue the, the, the education, usually uh, boys who've been uh, uh, selected to do that um, by like uh, 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 social uh, uh, um, roles and also by like um, protection lens. Thank you. Thank you, Muzina. Dina, you seem you want to make a comment. Please go ahead. Um, I think Mosna really covered it very well, um, but I will add I will add one point. One of the things that we do notice across the board in um, in the majority of countries, and this is actually not limited to just developing countries, it's across the board the board globally. The threshold of what is accepted as um, sufficient education for young people is vastly different for women as opposed to for girls as opposed to boys. So, in a lot of cases, you'll see that parents, communities, and the society will perceive that a lower level of education is counted as sufficient. In certain countries, the laws in place try to equalize that, but without um, quota, not quotas, without required laws that give a minimum age of, of capping for education, we do see this trend. Um, and that to, to some extent might answer the question. It's also societally, we need to change this perspective that um, women only need a certain amount of, educa of education versus their male counterparts. Um, the one other thing I will, I will also just flag from a, from a perspective of looking at things online, it's really concerning to see that literacy now is being limited to just um, uh, the baselines of education that we had in, in the past two centuries. As somebody who is looking at the future and is always working on tech and what the future of technology will look like, education for women beyond the basics of just access to obviously language, uh, understanding the, the basics of mathematics and, and just the baseline of education, we also need to look at online, uh, the understanding of the online sphere as also a baseline education requirement, because that's where we're seeing a lot of the opportunities for women, whether it be economic opportunities, but also opportunities for dialogue. Um, so I, I definitely push for that, as well as coding and, and all that kind of work to be something that's considered as a baseline educational tool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Uh, maybe to, before we go to the next question, I'll request all of us, if, if you feel free, you turn on your cameras uh, so that uh, Robin can take a group photo. Only turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. 
Sergeant Rubin will take in take a quick group photo. Thank you. Um, the other the other question as we take a group photo, <laughs> uh, it goes to all all the speakers, including Mazina. What do we as educated women do to support girls' retention and co completion of education? If I may repeat, what do we as educated women do to support girls' retention and completion of education? It goes to all our speakers. Feel free to, to chip in and make your comment. Ruben, you tell us if you're done with the, with the group photo. So that we go back into our hideout. <laughs> yeah, I was just, somebody had asked in the chat if the group photo was included participants and the answer is yes. So um, yeah. it's, it's optional to show your, to show your, your video, but um, Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to our speakers, please, you may make your comment on, uh, if I may repeat the question once again, what do we as educated women do to support girls' retention and completion of education? Dina, do you want to go first? Um, sure, absolutely. I'm happy to, uh, Matsula. I think one of the main issues that I always discuss within the organizations that I work with is there is, we shy away in certain situations from asking for quotas. I know this is a controversial uh, point and, and people feel differently in certain situations, but I am a firm believer that quotas for girls' involvement, whether it be the quotas for equal representation in schools when we're giving funding. A lot of the people on this call have the privilege wow. of having an education that brings us to this table, um, which I think we all know is a rarity, especially from my side of the world. Um, and Musna can definitely add more, you know, more um, insight to that. But I think we really need to hold ourselves accountable to say when we are afforded the privilege of being at the table, we need to hold everybody around us accountable in the form of asking for resourcing to be tied to quotas for women's uh, representation, both at the table but also in the resourcing that we're given. If you are writing a grant, if you're asking for a grant, if you are sharing grant um, support, please make sure that a quota is involved, is included. Um, please make sure that experts in gender mainstreaming are included. All of these things can sometimes be scary if we are asking for funding from a, a, from a larger body. I know I've, I've done it a, a hundred times, but I think it is incredibly important for those of us who have been given the opportunity to be at the table to help support everybody else to make sure that they get a voice as well. That's it from my side, Matsula. Thank you, Dina. Uh, any of our speakers uh, who has anything to add? Okay, I'll go to the next question. Uh, I think this is more of a comment and uh, the, there's a participant who says that for policymakers to be able to come up with policies in favor of women and girls, we need many more women as policymakers. Um, okay. Okay. We need many more women as policymakers. There is need need of obligatory education i think i think this is more of a comment than a, than a, than, a, than a question there is a question here for all of us and uh, what strategies can we put in place to ensure the promotion of local indigenous women's knowledge in peace building what strategies can we put in place to ensure the promotion of local indigenous women's knowledge in peace building feel free to make your comment to all our uh, presenters. What strategies can we put in place to ensure the promotion of local indigenous women's knowledge in, in peace building? From my side, I think we need like, to bring everybody on, on board. One speaker here alluded to the fact that, may, actually, I think it kept coming out from all, all speakers that, you know, many women and girls are not brought on on table because of the different patriarchal challenges. 
So to this question, I think we, it is high time, like Samantha was saying, that we need to step up our game as women, human rights defenders and all advocates and bring all women on, on, on board. Matsula, I'm, I'm going to jump in here with just one other comment. I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up all no, of the time free. as well. Free. Um, but I do want to say that when we look at our male counterparts, we see that in a lot of circumstances, there is a requirement that um, minority representation is also included. And it's not just that because they have one man, then that speaks for all men. And I think we should do the same. I think just because one woman is afforded a seat at the table, that does not mean that one woman through her experience can speak to all of the experiences of the women around her. So again, sorry, excuse the sound. So again, one of the things that I would advocate for is a lot of times we are brought on to check a box to say we had a woman at the table. Those of us at the table need to say, indigenous women have an experience that can be vastly different from all the women around, um, around the table at any other point. So requiring that just because, when we look at men, it's not just because one man is there, we check the box and we say, our male equivalents have filled the box for all the other minorities. It's a requirement that if you are indigenous, you're represented. If you're from um, a certain group, you're represented. We should do the same. Sometimes it can be scary because you know one woman is is the only space that sometimes they will that will be allowed because of societal and patriarchal um, parameters. But again, stating that not just one woman can speak on behalf of an entire gender globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dina. Also, I like I have uh, one comment from my personal story. So uh, we should also remember that requirements sometimes it's so difficult to reach for women be women peace builders. Uh, like for like one example from Syria, uh, for uh, for us like uh, to apply for any kind of uh, academic level like for master or like even undergrad we need to provide like uh, IELTS uh, uh, license, which is also uh, required to have a valid passport. And for refugees, it's so hard uh, to, to get like a, a passport as like there's like a, a punishment from our government and also uh, against the activists but also it's it's so expensive uh, to to uh, to have a passport so not all refugees have passport to apply for IELTS exam and also to get the score to apply after for uh, the uh, academic uh, level and uh, and also like from my experience um uh, when I, I I been in Turkey after I, I left Syria, I uh, I came to Canada through a, a Nobel Women's Initiative uh, by the program Sister to Sister Mentorship Program, which is like give me the the the, the options to uh, to be in a safe space and also to continue my education. Which, which like took me like a four years like now after my arrival to Canada to uh, to start my master degree in in public policy because like also uh, education is so expensive so we should remember that uh, uh, to ask our academia uh, academic institution and also our, our NGOs to provide scholarships and grants for women peace builders to continue their education thank you thank you Amazina. Um... There is another question here, still it is to all of us. What are some of, uh, I think, strategies put in place, put in place to decentralize the education sector for those who are incapacitated for formal education in Africa? What are some of the strategies that have been put in place to decentralize education sectors for those who are incapacitated for, inform for formal education in Africa? Any of our speakers can make a comment. Hello, um, are you there, Asha? Can yes, you hear me? Yes, Samantha. Yes, uh, one of the strategies can be informal training. Um, 
this can be used to provide the different skills. Because we said earlier that it is not only formal education that we need, okay? One can thrive on something else. People are talented. Here in Africa, people do not value what they call talent, but people are talented. People sing, girls sing, they are dancers. So apart from even the informal trainings, but we also need to begin to tap on talents of these young girls. And then I also had uh, something to add on the question that was asked prior. On, on the strategies that we as educated women, what exactly are we doing to, to help these uneducated women? And I was saying that one of the things that uh, we are doing is uh, drafting laws, bills. We have been involved in a lot of uh, drafting. Uh, for example, I personally spearheaded and I participated in the drafting of the domestic violence bill, which is now the Domestic Violence Act. And uh, right now we have also moved the Uganda Law Reform Commission. So one of the strategies that we are doing is actually pushing for amendment of a K clause. These laws that tend to have a discrimination of some sort against women, we can actually push for them to either be scrapped off or uh, amended or something of the sort. Then there is also the need to hold our governments accountable. Sometimes we see government allocating resources to schools to support the girl child, but we don't know where these resources go. Okay, considering even corruption, the corruption that our country is facing. So it is important for us who have the opportunity to come out and speak and begin to hold our governments accountable and not shy away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samantha. Oksana, do you have any comment or additions? Um, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to speak to specific experiences of, of Africa because uh, mm -hmm. of my background. What I wanted to, to add uh, in terms of centering other forms of knowledge and uh, putting them in the room, um, what critical and creative education has taught me is that um, the first thing we can do uh, in terms of broadening uh, the the toolbox that we use uh, and broadening uh, the amount of people that are represented in the room is to move away from uh, the binary thinking, uh, is to move away from thinking that there is either this or that, there is, uh, you know, left or right, men or women, and um, creating spaces and discussions where uh, those who make decisions and uh, those who create educational programs and all of us together are actually able to look at uh, how we learn and at what we learn and what knowledge looks like in multitude of ways. Um, and for me, it's, it's, it's a very important step towards um, inviting uh, different approaches, uh, giving space to them and being open uh, to them. And uh, at the same time as uh, being able to actually consciously promote them. I know there are many uh, holders of uh, approaches, learning techniques, knowledge forms, uh, who are sitting back and thinking, uh, this is not part of the mainstream, this is not part of uh, what I've seen, what I've learned, and this is not going to be welcomed. So we often uh, restrain ourselves as well from bringing in uh, what we can offer. So um, I think this uh, opening up of, uh, of this very narrow box um, is, is extremely important. And uh, finally, I would say supporting each other on this path and encouraging each other to be innovative, to be bold, and to, bra to, to bring to the table what we have to offer uh, is extremely important because when we do get fl uh, backlash, which unfortunately we, we made by bringing something new and different and something that hasn't been tried, um, it's good to know that we have somebody to support us in um, going through the backlash and coming back again. Thank you, Oksana. Mozani, are you there? Maybe if you could share, if you have any reflections, please feel free to go right ahead. Mozani, not Mozena. Mozani, are you there? I, Robin, am I pronouncing the name right? I hope I am. Um, I think so. Musumi, she might have stepped away. I'm not sure, but we. Um, 
it, it seems she she stepped away. So I think at this point we shall have to end with uh, with with Oksana. Uh, for me, I want to thank all of you as we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. I must also take this opportunity to thank Cody, thank Robin and the entire team for organizing this uh, very wonderful discussion. But above all, to, to thank our presenters for taking off time your busy schedule to come and share your experiences with us. From me to you, thank you so much and bye-bye. Uh, maybe just one reminder, uh, because I've looked at the chat box, there is a lot that is coming, com coming up please go to the CODI website and join the discussion forum. For any questions that we've not answered, please, let's join our discussion right there at the website. Thank you so much. Robin, to All you. All right. Thank you, Mahdullah. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Robin Matsuda. Really grateful Thank for you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.